May we request those on the foyer to please come back to the room. We are starting the next session. Welcome to the second session on day two of the soft power conference. The theme for this session is public diplomacy, successes and challenges in nation building. The session is divided into two parts. We will first have a keynote address by Sri Sayyad Akbaruddin, followed by a panel discussion. Sri Sayyad, Sri Sayyad Akbaruddin ji will speak on soft power and public diplomacy, the opportunities and challenges in international fora. We begin this session by first inviting the chair for this session, Sri Kaval Sibal ji, to please join us on stage. Sri Kaval Sibal ji is a former foreign secretary of the government of India. In a distinguished diplomatic career of 41 years, he served as our ambassador to Egypt, France, and Russia. And most recently, he was also a member of India's National Security Board. We are honored to have you with us, sir. Thank you. May I now invite the keynote speaker for this session, Ambassador Sayyad Akbaruddin ji, to please join us on stage. Ambassador Sayyad Akbaruddin ji is the permanent representative of India to the United Nations and has represented India's interests in various capacities, promoting friendly ties across the globe. As the official spokesperson of the MEA in 2020 to 2012 to 2015, he e effectively used social media to uh, considerably expand India's public diplomacy outreach. He's previously served as a uh, civil servant at the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, and also served at Indian missions in Cairo, Riyadh, New York, Islamabad, and Jeddah at various diplomatic levels. Please give a huge round of applause to our keynote speaker, <laughs> Ambassador Sayyad Akbaruddin. <laughs> May I now request Ambassador Kaval Sibal to please take over the proceedings for this session. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm very honored and pleased that I've been given this occasion to chair uh, this session. Uh, soft power has now become very fashionable as a concept. Uh, and it has, uh, is now being distinguished from uh, hard power. My own view is that uh, unless you are hard power, you can't make your soft power effective. Um, and the soft power is actually a tool uh, to make your hard power acceptable. Uh, because hard power is crude and soft power has a softer face. And then countries who have a lot of soft power uh, don't necessarily influence the international environment in a way that will advance and protect their interests. I mean, we see a lot of uh, Hollywood films. We enjoy them. But when we come out, it doesn't necessarily mean that we support US foreign policy in every way. I believe the Hol Bollywood films are very popular in Pakistan, but that doesn't help us <laughs> to handle our relations. But anyway, I think in today's interconnected world, uh, where everybody is connected to each other and more so in, in, through the social media, there's so many exchanges going on at so many levels. Instantaneously, what happens in one part of the world affects another part of the world. 
So we have to pay far more attention to communication as such. And it's through communication and that you develop better understanding. And through better understanding, perhaps you can advance your overall political security and other interests because people will begin to understand you better and empathize with you. And that's where instead of what used to be called information uh, and publicity is now called public uh, diplomacy. But we have a person who has practiced public diplomacy professionally very ably. He was uh, head of our external publicity division. Do we call it public di diplomacy division now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, and he was very successful at that. He's been spokesman uh, of the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, which is part of uh, what you might call soft power because soft power means that you should be <laughs> able to explain hard things very softly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm just trying to, uh, he has a subject on which he's going to He's going to speak on soft power and public diplomacy opportunities and challenge in the international fora. Over to you, uh, Akrabuddin. And after he's spoken for about 15 minutes, we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Sibyl and ladies and gentlemen. Um, I don't want to get into this uh, argument about uh, soft power, smart power, sharp power, hard power. So uh, if you see from what uh, Ambassador Sibyl said, I deleted soft. It's now only India's public diplomacy approach, successes and challenges. Um, you know, um, those of us who have to think on the feet, uh, when I knew that Ambassador Sibyl was coming, I knew his viewpoint, so I quickly decided that I will skirt this issue. <laughs> so there you are. Uh, we try to act sometimes smart, if not softly. But uh, what I will do is, uh, diplomats usually talk a lot, but what I want you to do is to listen. So I have here for you about five or six um, videos and I'd like you to listen because they are not Indian speaking. And if they are Indian speaking, they're followed by others speaking. Uh, the important thing is that uh, we need to listen to what others are saying. Uh, then you will understand what our successes are and what our challenges are. So uh, my job will only be to try and take you through those uh, five or six uh, short videos, uh, obviously, uh, these are um, uh, not comprehensive. Uh, in 15 to 20 minutes, I can't be comprehensive. I've just chosen five or six, but they will indicate a trajectory. And that trajectory will indicate to you uh, from where we've started and where we intend to, where we are proceeding. So uh, with those uh, initial words, I will quickly try and give you some examples of how our public diplomacy approach was in the past how is it in the present and what is there in the future, using all aspects of power, soft, smart, sharp, and even hard if required. So with those opening words, um, let me start off uh, with the past. And um, as Ambassador Sibyl said, soft power is at play in global, uh, in the, on the global stage. Everybody uses it, even though if the term was used only recently in the 1990s, um, it goes back. And we've been adept at using these irrespective to give us a uh, image of a country which um, has a certain approach to um, global issues. Thank you. 
following the theme, traditions of peace and nonviolence. Such a beautiful principle and a fitting theme for this year. From the centennial of the birth of Nelson Mandela, a man who resolutely and peacefully defended the rights of millions. To the 150th anniversary of the birth of Mahatma Gandhi, an individual whose very name evokes images of pacifism and nonviolence. <laughs> Just, I just, yeah, I just played this uh, just to indicate everybody is in this game. Uh, we are not the only ones. Everyone is in this game, um, but we can't be left behind. Uh, we can use what is available to us to try and promote a broader theme. Uh, you can use music just for itself, but you can use it linked with nonviolence, peace. You can use peace with Mahatma Gandhi. You can use Mahatma Gandhi as perhaps the icon as far as India is concerned. I mean, there is a theme when you use this in international issues. But that's perhaps soft power 101. You can go beyond that because international fora are also places where soft values are created. And I'd like you to listen to somebody who worked on this 70 years ago. Uh, not many of you here perhaps know of her, but perhaps one of the most significant roles that an Indian has played in international issues. Hansa Mehta. I don't know how many of you here are aware of her signal contribution to global values. One. I'm, I'm certain there will be several others, but they would be. But the large majority don't know. Just have a look and then we'll talk about it. We stand today at the threshold of a great event, both in the life of the United Nations and in the life of mankind. This universal declaration of human rights may well become the international Magna Carta the world can thank our daughter of India, Dr. Hansa Mehta, for replacing the phrase in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. He said, uh, all men are born free and equal. Now it's changed. All human beings are born free and equal. The dynamics in the United Nations changes radically during the years 1946 to 48, in which the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is being drafted, debated, and voted through different bodies in the United Nations. At the outset, the United States and France, they place a strong emphasis on earlier notions of the rights of man articulated in their respective constitutions. India had already been a member of the United Nations by 1945, and had voted for the charter that same year. But while gaining full independence in 1947, India sends a delegate to the Commission on Human Rights famous for having presented the national flag that same year on behalf of the women of India, Hansa Mehta. Eleanor Roosevelt has not reacted to the use of rights of man in the initial draft, which is now brought to debate by Hansa Mehta. The preamble of the first draft reads, quote, the General Assembly, and this might have been your preamble, recognizing the fact that the United Nations has been established for the, for the specific purpose of enthroning the natural rights of man to freedom and equality before the law and for upholding the worth and dignity of human personality, end quote. Hansa Mehta, the only female he delegate in the Commission on Human Rights besides Eleanor Roosevelt, objects to, to the use of man in the draft. 
arguing that member states can use this to restrict women's rights rather than expand them, since women are not necessarily regarded as included by that wording. One other person that was such a big influence on Eleanor Roosevelt was India's Hansa Nehta. For the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it was Hansa Nehta who said, excuse me, Mrs. Roosevelt, if you say all men are created free and equal, around the world it will be all men, women not included. And so the words were changed to all human beings. That small change has had a tremendous impact. Women will be included everywhere. All human beings, men and women and children, have these rights. Seventy years ago, one Indian woman using a soft touch changed not only soft law, but hard international law. <laughs> but we have failed her. When I asked at the beginning here, how many of us know her? Not many. Not many also know what she did, how she's regarded. It took her 70 years to acknowledge what was perhaps one of the most significant roles of soft power in, of Indian diplomacy. We've just forgotten. We just keep that in mind going forward. Our problem is today, from a country which changed you, all men are born equal to all humans are born equal, today we are told that we seem to be one of the most dangerous places in the world for women. Excuse me, how did this happen? We forgot one of our successes. We lost our way somewhere around. We just need to keep that in mind, that public diplomacy is not only getting it right, but also keeping on harping that you got it right, because it has a demonstration effect. Otherwise, ne the next generation and the generations after that will not know what you stood for. Just keep that in mind as we go for another one. This is certainly even Ambassador Sibyl will not say this is soft, but I will indicate why I've clubbed this into this discussion of public diplomacy, smart power, soft power. Contribution to peacekeeping, just have a look at what others are saying about India's contributions. Uh, somehow, unko Indian medicines were very much faith. contribution you have made to inspiring Liberian women. For that, we will always be grateful. Bye, Liberia. Bye. In all these conflicts, Indian soldiers have distinguished themselves through discipline, training, and professionalism. As a matter of fact, India has always been one of the largest peacekeeping countries. Um, and today, 7,700 Indian peacekeepers have deployed around the world, and the Indian woman formed the first ever all-female UN police unit which was deployed in Liberia. You have indeed given a very strong contribution to global solidarity and to international peace and security. And a total of 163 Indian peacekeepers, the highest number of all two contributing countries, as you mentioned, Ambassador, have given their lives for peace. India has contributed indeed to the freedom, peace of the people of South Sudan. In the case of Hansa Mehta, 
we got the concept right. We didn't do the implementation properly, perhaps. In the case of peacekeeping, we got the implementation right. We didn't stand up and take responsibility for the notion of protection of civilians. Today, in international law, protection of civilians is amongst the most important uh, efforts that any international effort is part of. We were the first, goes back to 1961, when Captain Saleria was given the Paramvir Chakra. No other Indian has ever been given the Paramvir Chakra for having uh, performed outside the boundaries of India, uh, in Africa. Yet, we forgot to, to continue to take ownership of protection of civilians. Today, it's the norm. Just keep that. We need to get the norm right. We need to get the implementation right if we have to get full credit for what we are doing. If you don't, others take over, they move on. Life moves on. And that's part of, being, uh, of our challenge. I'd like now to skip from that to the more recent present so that you can try and look at how things have changed since then. We've learned our lessons to get the norm right, to get the implementation right. आइए हम एक अंतर्राष्ट्रीय योग दिवस को आरंभ करने की दिशा में कार्य करें I just thought this I'll use as a small example of getting both right. Sure, you can ask after Om Shanti, 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 does it mean that India is now able to promote greater global peace? Perhaps no. But the point is we are working on an understanding that you need to get the process right, you need to get the thought right, you need to get the implementation right. Otherwise, uh, apart from the International Yo Day of Yoga, there are 200 other international days. You do not find them being celebrated with that enthusiasm. Sure, the government of India puts its entire machinery behind it. Sure, but there is a reason for that. Once you get a thought right, use that continuously. Don't give up. Don't think that it's a uh, one-off thing. In public diplomacy, you need to be persistent, consistent. Only then can you claim ownership of anything. I mean, that's the only short point I'd like to raise with this. Let's go to the next step. I think there is a bit of a glitch. Yes, we are back. I'd like you to look at what are India's major needs. Uh, essentially, as a developing country, India's major challenges will always be internal, always. Given that we are a country of a billion plus, every aspect of our foreign policy, our public diplomacy will be geared towards improving our internal conditions. Uh, and therefore, all aspects of our foreign policy will be targeted. How do we improve that? 
So just have a look at two or three of the big challenges that India is facing and how we are trying to marry them with global concerns. Aaj, International Solar Alliance Dunia ke liye umid ki ek badi kiran ban kar saamne aya hai. Hum bhi ek dream le kar ke chale. Ki ek dunia ek suraj ek dream one world one sun one grid ISA has the right scale of ambition for this moment in the energy transition, an energy transition which will make the world more inclusive, fairer, cleaner and better for all. Thank you for your leadership. Dignity of women. तो दुनिया की कौन सी ताकत हैं जो हमारे शहर गांव को आकर के गंदा कर दें? The Clean India Mission builds on its genius and lifelong quest for human dignity. It is by far, Honourable Prime Minister, not only the largest investment, but the largest campaign of people's mobilisation in this area around the world. It is inspiring to see the international community come together around this important issue. An estimated 2.3 billion people worldwide still do not have basic sanitation facilities. I believe that what's happening in India is quickly changing the statistics. Climate or calamity ka culture se siddha rista hai. Climate ki chinta jab tak culture ka hissa nahi hoti, tab tak Calamity se bachpana mushkil hai. Pariyavaran ke pati Bharat ki samvedana ko aaj vishwa svikar kar raha hai. My dear Modi ji, political vision, political leadership, political dedication, that's what so often is lacking. And that's what I admire so much from you. You are providing that to India and to the much wider world. I just thought I'll just try and portray to you the three biggest challenges India is facing. Environment, climate, as well energy, as well as sanitation. All these are being linked increasingly in our foreign policy projections. Um, there is no shame in acknowledging that you need to improve. Before 2014, I don't know of many times whether any Indian diplomat stood up and talked of sanitation. Uh, maybe Ambassador Sibyl could tell us ever in the 45 years before that whether we did. We didn't. But today we are confident enough to stand up, acknowledge your shortcomings and try to link up with global trends and try to improve ourselves. That's the changing face of Indian public diplomacy. And that we need to keep uh, in mind as we look at how we are going into the future. And I'd like to end with a small clip. Again, what others seem to be thinking of what we are doing. India's approach to cooperation can be summarized as Vasuhaiva Kutumbakam, or the whole world is one family. India was amongst the first countries to, to respond to our appeal for assistance after Hurricane Irma ravaged our twin island. Developing uh, agribusinesses uh, in Benin for a better attractiveness of agricultural job is one of the primary objectives uh, of India and the UN uh, Partnership Fund. Uh, we receive uh, a huge amount of money from, for our standards, and it's for our baseline report on our SDGs. The project aligned with, a, with SDG 16 will strengthen the Uruguayan government's accountability towards its citizens. So let us tap into 
the experience and philanthropy of India in order to make the South-South cooperation a reality. India is really showing its strength that they can also be a good partner in ensuring that people remain healthy. Grenada is profound gratitude to you personally. You have taken a personal hand in, 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 in getting these projects approved in expeditious manner. So I say India, the project accelerator. And your assistance to us working through UNICEF will enable us reach children who really need help. And Belize has benefited from it, I can personally say so. And I thank you for taking this leadership role as an emerging superpower. India is, for all of us, a very important inspiration. So what's common about all this? Not what they said. We, these are all countries where we don't have a single mission, where no prime minister has gone in recent times. All I wanted to say was the reach of public diplomacy goes beyond foreign policy apparatus. Uh, you can see ambassadors from all these countries speaking of their engagements with India with no Indian mission being present there. Uh, it always is a testimony to extending your reach beyond what you is otherwise possible and that's what public diplomacy is all about. So if I can quickly summarize what can we look at as trends in India's public diplomacy in the next few years. Increasingly, it's, it's philosophically in tune with our traditions. So you will find more terminologies, which some of us may not be familiar with, but is inherent in our tradition. Whether that lady was struggling to use the term Vasudeva Kutumbakam, this will become increasingly a term that we will use. It will link India's good with global good in every area of our activity. Of necessity, as a developing country, it will always be development oriented because that's primary for us. Obviously, as a foreign policy posture, it will provide for a role for India, perhaps a leadership role. And finally, while it's good for India, it will also be captured in a way that it is good for the world because it's imbued with a sense of universalism. There are others who look at making improvements for themselves only for themselves, but our approach will be cloaked in a broader, uh, a broader veil. What are the challenges for this? I can certainly look at it separately, but as Ambassador Sibyl and others have said, that if you want to enhance your soft power, you need, I would just make a slight adjustment to what was said before, soft power requires loud platforms and hard money. I thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Akhapuddin. As they say, a picture speaks more than a thousand words, so I'm glad you uh, presented these video clips to make your point more effectively. Clearly, we have a lot of uh, goodwill uh, across the world, even in countries, as you say, we are, where we are not diplomatically represented. And therefore, I hope that this soft power that we have will one day get converted into a permanent membership of the UN Security Commission. Please. Hi, thank you very much, and thanks uh, for the presentation. Um, I actually have quite a different view. <laughs> um, and where I stand um, right now, I live in Europe, I see actually the failure of multilateral organizations. I see UN, the UN losing a lot of its uh, credibility. I see the European Union under threat. Um, I'm also South African. I see the African Union as being largely discredited. UNESCO, ICOM. Um, and and I, part of me thinks that the, pos the reason why um, these institutions are not somehow resonating amongst a lot of people 
is because they fail to, in fact, make use of soft power in a particularly sophisticated way. That there is an idea that, that soft power um, is top down, <laughs> is a velvet hand over a steel glove, is about still finance and army and development aid. Um, when in fact, when we look at influence on the global stage, um, and many of us here are in the form of culture and not, not just on the UN stage, but popular culture, we talked about cuisine, we talked about a lot of other forces outside of multilateral institutions that in fact have a lot of power of how people think and behave and ultimately act. So my question is, is that do you think, in fact, that these multilateral institutions that work on an extremely administrative platform um, are able to, in fact, compete on the stakes of soft power? Can we have two more questions and then perhaps you can answer all three together? Thank you, Mr. Akbaruddin, for such a nice presentation. My question is about uh, discussions in the my question is about discussions in the American academic circles uh, regarding the public diplomacy. Like uh, it should be um, the government should take the back seat and the civil society should be allowed to come uh, come up and take up the public di uh, diplomacy issue uh, uh, because soft power is uh, is primarily a, a civil society affair because uh, Bollywood is not government's creation or for that matter, Indian cuisine or Indian substantial culture or the popular culture or that the government's uh, creation. So uh, how can we, you know, think of uh, applying this approach in the Indian context? Thank you. You will raise your arm before, please. Go ahead. So thank you for uh, educating us on uh, Dr. Ansa Mehta. It's really a shame that most of, most of us have not uh, read about her. Uh, the second thing is, uh, he talked about the Indian Army. They do commendable work, and then the media do write about their exemplary work uh, in terms of peacekeeping force. But the same media writes differently when they are in Kashmir. How did soft diplomacy fail Indian Army in Kashmir? That is, uh, it's the same army which has been very well regarded. In fact, I've read where people prefer Indian peacekeeping force to others. But whereas in Kashmir, it's a different story. Why is that? Uh, the next thing I, is... I, I think, let, let him answer these three questions. I think the okay. last one question, that is enough. Yeah. Um, so let me start with the question on uh, 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 public diplomacy and soft power essentially being a civil society function. And I agree with you. Uh, it's not only for ICCR to provide uh, sustenance. So uh, if there are philanthropists standing up, raise your hands now. Uh, we are ready to provide platforms, but we need people to stand up and provide the hard money that I said. Governments can provide loud platforms, but hard money, it has to come from other sources too. If you don't, we are of necessity required to do so. So if anybody from civil society wants to do so, and there are many doing it, but there is never enough. So government chips in. Uh, it should not be ever thought that government is the primary source. Coming to multilateralism, ma'am, I am a diplomat. I am multilateralism, bilateralism, plurilateralism, uh, trilateralism are only means for me to promote my country's interests. So if multilateralism is failing, it's not because of me. It's because of other reasons. I am committed to it. There are other factors and forces which certainly are overtaking those other factors. Uh, but let's not forget, you may deride ultimately for gaining hard international laws, final legal recognition, you will have to go back to some, um, uh, some body which has the legal imprimatur. You may do it forcefully. Uh, you may decide on taking any action you want. Finally, 
ultimately you will have to go for a de jure recognition and that can only be provided beyond individual or bilateral context in a multilateral context. And let's not forget that. I am not going to make that argument that X is better or Y is better. I think all have a role and it's for them to work uh, that out. True, I agree entirely with you. Today, multilateralism is not providing that outcome and people have a right to question. But you can make the same argument about bilateralism not working today. Because what we are seeing is big power competition, not big power cooperation. And that is across the board, whether it's bilateral, multilateral, trilateral, plurilateral, every lateral. And that is a cause for concern for all of us. And we need to see what will be the implications of that. And that's another story. So that's my long-winded answer to your question. As regards what you have said, um, again, I'm a diplomat. I look at where I'm involved in. And you yourself said, and that's repeated by everybody else, that uh, among the top country, um, uh, ca uh, personnel are always Indian personnel. The United Nations recently did a survey of how they rate people. And out of four, Indian troops got 3.9. There was a shortcoming of 0.01% in issues relating to equipment. Uh, other than that, outstanding. Your question about uh, whether the same is not a factor uh, in other places, I, I think we need to understand the dynamics. Um, in some places, there are four factors extraneous to us who play a disproportionate role. Uh, let's not discount. In border regions, there are factors beyond the role of our internal um, uh, forces. So let's not dis di um, um, uh, ignore that. Um, perhaps that is one factor uh, in a role. In a environment where the entire, in you see peacekeepers always operate once the international community has a agreement on what to do. Uh, in cases like in, uh, uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, the problem is that there are forces and factors beyond our control who are acting in a manner that is inimical to our interests. And at times, uh, these are, are spiral out of control. But if the Indian Army uh, has one accolades ev everywhere else, there is no reason to think that it is performing in a manner which is untoward elsewhere. So. I think, no, no, we're not going to have a debate. Yeah, we don't no. need to have a discussion on that. But my simple point is that keep in mind there are other factors in play. And we leave it at that. Actually, we really, really overshot uh, this. I think we should move on to the panel discussion. I'm sorry that a lot of the hands were raised, but we really don't have time. But maybe when we have this panel discussion, some of these issues will arise again, and those who have raised their hands can raise them again, and we'll give them an opportunity. Thank you, Sayed uh, Yaqabuddin. And please give him a big applause. Thank you, Ambassador Sayyid Say Say Akbaruddinji, for a fascinating and a very comprehensive presentation. Can we please have a huge round of applause <laughs> for Ambassador Sayyid Akbaruddin? <laughs> May we request uh, Ambassador to remain with us as we move to the second part of this, of this session, which is a panel discussion on public diplomacy. Uh, as my colleagues just arranged the seats for the three panelists. I just want to thank Ambassador Say Sayed Akbaruddin for especially reminding us about the pioneering contributions of Captain Saleria and Hansa Mehtaji, and also his important message that it's not just enough to get it right in public diplomacy, but also harping on getting it right. The next part of our session is a panel discussion on public diplomacy, successes and challenges in nation building, for which we have three very distinguished panelists amongst us. Yeah. 
may I first invite Dr. J. Wang, who is the director of USC Center on Public Diplomacy uh, and a professor at the USC Anberg School of Communication and Journalism, to please join us on stage. USC Center of Public Diplomacy is our academic partner for the Soft Power Conference. And Dr. J. Wang, uh, apart from being a director of the USC Center, is also a leading thought leader on soft power and nation branding. Thank you, Dr. Wang, we're happy to have you here. Our next panelist is Mr. Kirian Drake, who's a minister counselor and head of politics and press at the British High Commission in India. He has vast experience in public diplomacy, having led large teams in UK Treasury, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and Prime Minister's Strategy Unit. Thank you, Mr. Drake. We are very happy to have you. And finally, may I invite Mr. Jonathan McClory, who's the General Manager for Asia in Portland Communication and an associate at the Institute of Government. He is the author of the very influential Soft Power 30 report, which comes out and uh, remains an important voice on the issues relating to soft power. Thank you, Mr. McClory. We are very happy to have you as part of the panel. May I now request uh, Kamal Sibalji to please take over the proceedings for the panel discussion. Well, thank you. Now, I don't know with what thought you came on the stage to deliver half an hour speeches or not, but I think you're going to get 10 minutes each because uh, we should leave some time for Q&A since the first session became rather, first half of the session became rather long. So do make your points pithily, precisely, concisely, and tellingly, and go ahead. I'll start with you. Please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, it's great to be here, and uh, as um, uh, the organizer just mentioned that the USC Center on Public Diplomacy is one of the partners of this very important gathering, and we are very delighted to be here to be the partner, and uh, let me also add our welcome to all of you to uh, today's uh, forum. Now, obviously, the value of public diplomacy has increased uh, steeply in light of the strategic challenges uh, as outlined uh, in our, uh, uh, by uh, our previous speakers but as well as lots of opportunities for many countries around the world. It is truly now a global phenomena uh, for us to be here in India to talk about public diplomacy uh, is, a, uh, is a testament uh, to the fact that uh, this uh, uh, phenomena has gone global and involving a multitude of actors and networks beyond just the sovereign states. For the United States, obviously, uh, as an instrument of soft power, public diplomacy acts as an indispensable counterbalance to our nation's hard military power. Now, like uh, many other sectors in our social life, the practice of public diplomacy is being disrupted by profound rapid changes in global political economy and especially in digital technology. So what I'll do is I'll focus on more on the practice of public diplomacy from the perspective that it is a set of communication-centric activities and how this set of activities uh, are being disrupted uh, by the geopolitical uh, situation, but also the technological advancements. Uh, as we all know that these days, even authoritarian governments are paying attention to public's views and to uh, rely on more and more on the consent of the public uh, for their legitimacy. So the practice of public diplomacy, um, as we see it from a communications perspective, if you look at from the context of communication, from the audiences of, uh, you know, you're trying to reach, the platforms and tools you, know, you now use, and also the people who are doing the communicating, all of these are changing. And I have to say that the disruption are so sweeping that we don't really have a very good playbook or roadmap to guide us going forward. Uh, for instance, the audiences for public diplomacy are changing. And most of this, it's actually a simple fact of demographic shifts. So we, we are seeing, in, uh, for instance, in the developed economies, the aging of population, right, in the youth bulge in, develop, uh, in the developing uh, countries, and the overall audience are becoming more urban, and the population mix in many of the Western nations is gonna go in ethnic remapping due to massive migration. And we now also have, for the first time in human history, uh, more people joining the middle class and they turn to digital platforms for news and information and for social interactions. We also face an impassioned public, both at home and abroad, 
And in this respect, what's old is new again, because the rising populist fervor in many parts of the world is really the latest face off of this paradoxes uh, between the two fundamental human forces of interest and passions in social decision and human action. So as we transit from a, a, you know, a more monocultural existence to a, a multicultural existence, many people may not have the resources, the capacity to adjust uh, to that transition and that's brought forth by the mobility of information, capital, and people. So these counter encounters of cultures and peoples uh, have it provoked uh, our basic impulses of prejudice, especially in light of the fact that uh, people see real or even uh, just a fear downward economic uh, mobility. Another example of the disruption, as I mentioned earlier, is in the tools and platforms. Obviously, in digitiza digitization, advanced analytics, analytics are changing the way people seek information and stay connected uh, in a platform-based media ecosystem, and it is very fragmented, but also interlocking. Virtual reality, uh, uh, augmented reality tools are redefining how people experience uh, their life worlds, uh, worlds. AI automation are revolutionizing communication placement with precise targeting. The acceleration of digital technology has dissolved the boundaries of between what's domestic, what's uh, abroad, uh, making this interaction between the domestic concerns and the international e engagement ever more dynamic and interdependent. So these conditions and dynamics point to the basic reality of a growing diplomatic fluidity and a very challenging, fast-changing communication landscape. So what does that mean for the implementation of the practice of public diplomacy and to some extent also the study of public diplomacy, which the center uh, we focus a lot on? So I just want to make four brief points very quickly. So the first is that um, we need to make public diplomacy more strategic, strategic through a deeper understanding of what, what is called the theory of change. So what I mean here is that in a digital space, we actually, we, we don't lack data. There is voluminous data, observational data, in terms of how people uh, behave online. But the bigger challenge is that to develop the incapacity of fact checking and uh, uh, lots of other tools to dispel falsehoods and to stop their spreading. So I would argue that while facts are foundational, to capture audience attention and to get their buy-in, it is equally important to reveal and embody the emotional truth through public diplomacy work. So to design public diplomacy programs, we need to delve deeper into the underlying logic of communication given the complexities of the communication system. A related point would be in public diplomacy, it is not just about selling a country's message, selling a you know, in this other culture and how that culture practices or the, these, uh, uh, whatever the assets that provided that enrich their own, uh, own lives. So to tell an engaging story, which we emphasize uh, uh, quite a bit uh, in the soft power discussion, the public diplomacy discussion, is to move away from this being very self-centric, promoting a message to embracing the possibility of allowing your audience to see themselves in the stories you create, in the stories you share. So the third point is about, as we spend more time in a digital uh, world, so as our digital life inter acts, interacts ever more with the physical realm in this tech-dominated tech, tech environment, we need to strike a balance uh, between the digital and the physical. In other words, it is important to not only establish a very distinct digital voice and digital identity in your public diplomacy work, uh, it is also important to maintain the human touch through direct person-to-person -person contact because after all, physical presence represents a more elemental form of communication and a transcultural social condition. So the challenge in this kind of work, uh, as we just heard from our previous speaker, is that we do a lot of these cultural exchanges and the cultural activities. How do we scale this up uh, in this uh, new environment? Which leads to this, my last point is that we need to take a network view uh, that is centered on relationships, but not merely about messages. So what that means is that because people these days, from, in, uh, from um, elites to the you know, general public, uh, have the tools uh, to develop horizontal and vertical networks, and sometimes they have the potential to reach a global audience. So a network approach allows us to see a nation's position in its operational environment and identify key influences both online and offline and in their interaction uh, patterns, attitudes, and behavior. 
So obviously, as I uh, lay out, you know, all these uh, challenges that uh, uh, this task of public diplomacy is, is not getting any easier. Uh, as I said, there's no playbook uh, for the future of the practice. But this is also an exciting time because basically we are all at the starting point, not just in our field of public diplomacy, but even for other sectors of society, even in the private sector, even for general marketing, consumer marketing, that they are also trying to figure out you know, how, to, how to navigate uh, this uh, technologically dominated uh, environment, uh, but the information system is so uh, sort of fragmented as well, but also interlinked. So this is an exciting time uh, for us to experiment, to discover uh, what are these tools uh, uh, can be used uh, for public diplomacy efforts and what is the potential. So I hope that today's discussion and the discussion at this forum will inspire new thinking and experimentation uh, for practicing soft power. So let me start, stop here and then uh, uh, looking forward to uh, more discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wong. Now, May I invite Mr. Kieran Drake uh, to talk to us about his thinking on uh, soft power. Thank you very much, and it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, so as asked to talk about the, the successes and challenges um, of branding soft power, um, and I'm going to focus, as you might expect, on the successes uh, that we've experienced in the UK although maybe there'll be time as well to, to focus on some of the challenges uh, in the Q&A afterwards. Um, I'm going to do that by talking about our principal soft power campaign, which I'm sure most of you will have seen and hopefully many of you are aware of, um, and this is called the Great Campaign. Um, the campaign was designed originally to showcase the best what the UK has to offer uh, in order to encourage people to visit, study and do business with the UK. And it's our government's most ambitious international marketing campaign that we've ever run. Critically, and this is what I'll talk about, it, it succeeded in uniting the efforts of public and private sector. So referring back to the ambassador's comments about the requirement for hard cash, this is something that I think we've done very effectively in terms of utilising that from beyond government resources. Um, and as I show you, over the course of the seven years that it's been running, uh, it's delivered a highly visible, powerful campaign um, that's delivered tangible economic benefit for the UK. Um, and I suppose that's really the first point that I want to, to leave you with, first of three key points. Um, and that's that sometimes soft power is seen as somehow being a bit nebulous, a bit wishy-washy, hard to, hard to pin down. What we've found through, through the Great Campaign uh, is that soft power can deliver very tangible, very quantifiable benefits. Uh, and so we were very pleased again to be the top-ranked uh, country in terms of use of soft power uh, in Portland's rankings, um, and I'll show in the, in the next slide some of the, the economic benefits. Um, so the campaign was launched in 2012. Um, it was designed to coincide with the 2012 Olympics that were being held in London, uh, and our ambition was to create a £1 billion boost for British businesses. Uh, it's massively exceeded our expectations. Uh, we've got a return on investment of 20 to 1. It's delivered £3.9 billion, uh, certified by our National Audit Office benefits to date. Um, there's another £3.3 .3 billion uh, pounds worth of uh, benefits to the UK currently being appraised, and £1.8 billion in the pipeline. Um, we've recorded almost 20% of uplift in, in intentions to visit and study in the UK. Uh, from India, we've had 30% increases in international students over the last two years, for example. Uh, and we've been able to attribute a lot of that down to the success of the campaign. And it also has its own value as a brand. It's now valued at almost 300 million pounds, uh, and it's on track to become one of the 50 most valuable brands in the UK. Um, perhaps the most critical factor, uh, and this is my second key point I want to leave you with, perhaps the most critical factor in making a success of the, the great campaign is that for the first time, we were able to unite all of government beyond a si behind a single visual campaign with very clear, very strict branding. Um, uh, in the past, what we tried to do was individual ministries would run their own campaigns. Sometimes they'd have conflicting messages, sometimes even contradictory ones. With great all of government, 21 ministries united behind a single campaign, there's a single set of visuals. We use exactly the same images around the world, and it's that consistency um, that's really helped to increase the value of the brand and increase uh, th those intentions to visit, study, and do business with the UK. The next slide, sorry. 
Um, so since its launch in 2012, it's, it's grown enormously. We now run it in 144 countries worldwide. Uh, India is one of the countries we have a particular focus on. Last year, we ran over 1,000 uh, great branded campaigns in, in over 200 locations. Uh, last, last week, um, some of you may have been at the Future Tech Festival that we ran here in Delhi and in, in Mumbai, showcasing uh, UK and India collaboration, which again was uh, highlighting the way in which we're working. So how does the campaign work itself? So as I mentioned, this is about, sorry, next slide. Um, this is about uniting the, the power of public, private, and voluntary sectors. So partnership is at the heart of our campaign. Um, we have more than 600 businesses of all sizes and sectors have lent their support, given their time, given their energy, uh, in some cases given cash and sometimes given resources. Uh, here in Delhi, BP provided uh, a billboard space for us to run campaigns outside in Gandhi International Airport. Um, and we'll, you'll see that in terms of the, the uh, companies like McLaren, um, and next slide, uh, companies like Aston Martin, Mulberry, uh, Burberry, as well as less no, well-known, less uh, household name companies, but no less exciting ones like Framestore, who are uh, Oscar and BAFTA winning uh, organizations. So we've got support from private business. We've got support from uh, their royal highnesses. Next slide. Um, we've got support uh, as well, so, so Kate and uh, Prince William and, and Princess Kate, who were here in, um, uh, in 2016, they did a lot of great branded events as well, uh, and all of the royal family have, have lent their support to it. Uh, it's also, in terms of uh, ambassadors, we have over 300 high-profile people with a strong affinity for the, for the UK, acting as brand ambassadors, that's astronaut Tim Peake, uh, you'll also see actors, pop stars, uh, celebrities, business people also uh, supporting uh, the campaign and giving their time and their own brand willingly to support it. So how do the campaigns themselves work? Well, most people we know either know the UK or they have a perception or preconception about uh, what the UK is about, what it has to offer. That's, we found a huge advantage when it comes to marketing ourselves but it's also something that we're working to subvert a bit uh, and update and challenge through the, through the campaign. So I wonder, looking around the audience, I wonder what you think of when you think of the UK. For many people, we found initially that the, uh, their images of the UK, while being very positive, were perhaps slightly, uh, slightly dated. So people thought about iconic landmarks like the Houses of Parliament uh, or the Tower of London. They thought of the Scottish Highlands or the rolling English countryside, of World Heritage Sites. We've got 31 of those. Um, but they didn't think as much about modern Britain. So they, when they thought about London, they saw a red telephone box. They didn't see the shard or, or the gherkin. Um, when they thought about artwork, they thought about the fantastic uh, classical works of art that we have in our, our galleries and, and museums, which are all free. Um, but they didn't think about modern art like Banksy or, or the Angel of the North. Um, and they didn't think about modern attractions like, uh, like Harry Potter and the, the Warner Brothers studio tours and things like that. So what we've tried to do is to both showcase and build on the impressions that people have of the UK, but also, as I say, to kind of challenge and stretch some of those impressions so that people, uh, people look beyond what they might immediately uh, see as your, your national strengths. Uh, and that's really my third point. So we found that we need to utilize our assets, we need to build on them, we need to play to our strengths, and that's all informed by market research, by consumer research. Um, but we also want to play with those. We want to stretch them. We want to challenge them. We want to give people a new and, and surprising uh, experience of what the UK is all about. Um, and let me give you a couple of examples of how that's worked and how the campaigns itself have evolved. So education. Before the great campaign, um, we had a, a campaign called Education uh, UK. As I say, it, it wasn't as successful as it should have been, partly because uh, it, it competed with a lot of other campaigns. So we replaced that. We introduced knowledge is great, education is great. Um, it showcased what the UK has to offer to international students. We have four of the top 10 universities in the world. We have eight of the top 20. Um, and 12% of international students from around the world come to the UK. Um, and the first, the first images, the first campaign, really built on, on that uh, idea of UK academic excellence. So we showed images of Oxbridge colleges, like this one, um, uh, and, and played to that idea of, of, of academic excellence. But it's evolved. Um, now, 
we know that students know about UK academic excellence, so what we're doing is trying to show what else a UK education offers you. Um, so the latest um, uh, edition of the campaign, this Discover You, um, talks about, um, or talks to prospective students about the experience that they can get, the employability skills, and it starts with the student as being at the heart of it, uh, and showcases what they can get out beyond just the uh, beyond academic qualifications in terms of the experience, the connections, the skills, the contacts uh, that they will have in the UK. Similarly, on tourism, we started um, with a much kind of straighter image showcasing uh, UK heritage or UK countryside. Um, but again, we've updated that as the campaigns evolved. So we've, we've moved from this countryside is great uh, to a campaign called uh, OMGB. Next slide. Um, which was uh, supported again with social media development. It was so supported by a strong social media campaign. Um, and it challenged some of the, the stereotypes about the UK or the preconceptions that we know people held um, and was more about you and your personal experience of the UK. So you'll see people featuring those, those campaigns. Uh, and then the, last, the, the latest iteration of the, the campaign, which launched this January, uh, is called I Travel For. So it highlights fun, it highlights uh, next slide adventure. Uh, again, it's got, sorry, back one. Uh, so it's got people again uh, at the heart of it rather than just images of, of uh, UK cultural institutions or countryside. Um, and it tries to showcase what people might not know about the UK. Uh, so that nowhere in the UK is more than two hours drive, for example, from the coast. Uh, so we've got 6,000 islands and over 12,000 kilometers of coastline to explore. So a lot of it plays on, uh, on things like that. And it's working. So in the first nine months uh, of last year, we had a record number of visitors leaving uh, London, Edinburgh, Cambridge and Oxford, which are the traditional places that uh, the international tourists visit. Uh, we had 16 and a half million visitors leave London, which was a record number, up more than three percentage points on the previous years. Um, and so the campaigns will continue uh, to evolve in this way, responding, as I say, both to what people know and think about the UK and to continue to build on that uh, and to stretch and challenge them. I'm, I'm conscious of, uh, of time and limited time that we have to talk, so uh, very briefly, as you'd expect, it's about um, delivering economic benefits as well as, uh, as I say, some of the softer, less tangible ones. Um, so we have a large uh, investment campaign uh, that runs um, uh, internationally, particularly in, in trade fairs and also in, in ports, places of entry, so airports. Uh, both in the UK uh, and outside it, and similarly to this is the investment campaign, um, playing to the UK's uh, status as the fifth largest economy in the world and the largest financial centre, um, and similarly our trade campaign is an image in an airport um, which uh, encourages people to do business with the UK. Um, I'll finish, I'm sorry, this is, we make very good use of our uh, iconic landmarks as well. So this is one example in, in terms of cultural, uh, of, uh, that's um, uh, the headquarters of the uh, London, uh, Government of London offices in, uh, in the UK. Um, uh, tying in with the Shakespeare Festival that we were doing there. Who remains, Shakespeare remains the best known uh, Britain of all time. So again, we, we play to that and use uh, his image and obviously his works as a big part of our, our campaign. Now, as I said, we use consistent branding all around the world. We have very tight, uh, tight guidelines. Um, so you will see the same images with, uh, with the script and the language change, obviously, depending on the, the market that we're working in. Um, but the images remain the same. The, uh, the content remains the same, with one exception. Um, and that's in India. Because we recognize both the importance of um, the Indian market we have a huge personal connection, a living bridge, as Prime Minister Modi called it, that runs between the UK and India. Um, we have eight uh, direct flights from eight airports a day to the UK. We have uh, a diaspora of one and a half million people in, in the UK. We have um, more parliamentarians of, of Indian origin, Indian heritage than from any other country. And so we, and, and that looks largely to the past, but looking forward as well, we see the, the living bridge as something that connects us and drives us forward. And a lot of that is about collaboration that happens between governments, but also between institutions, between uh, businesses, between individuals. Um, and so we have uh, uniquely in the world a, uh, a Great Britain campaign called Great for Collaboration, uh, which runs in India, 
so these were the billboards that I mentioned. The space was donated by BP. This was a campaign that ran uh, outside um, Delhi Airport. Um, and you will see around the UK and around uh, Indian cities um, posters like the ones on the next slide um, promoting uh, and, and trumpeting and heralding uh, the fantastic collaboration that exists between the UK uh, and India. And we really do see that relationship uh, as a fantastic partnership. And this is one way in which our soft power, uh, we're working together in soft power collaboration, uh, as well as in many other forms of, uh, of, of collaboration. Uh, so that's really where I want to leave uh, my remarks today, other than just to reiterate. So for us, what we found with this campaign um, is that it works because we've brought We've brought everyone together. Um, so we've uh, united all of our government efforts behind a single, coherent, consistent campaign. We've done that in a way that plays to our, to our assets, to our strengths, uh, to what people know about the UK, but also that continues to challenge people's expectations. Uh, and we've done that in a way that delivers hard, economic, tangible benefits, uh, as well as a positive impression about the UK. Thank you very much. Thank you, <coughs> uh, Mr. Drake. <coughs> Britain has enjoyed a lot of hard power over centuries. And I think the uh, biggest source of soft power for Britain today <coughs> is the English language. And uh, you are capitalizing on this and uh, very successfully. The other is that when you had your Olympics, uh, you uh, showcase James Bond. So I was wondering whether he falls in the category of hard power or soft power. Uh, other question you asked was, what is it that first comes to your mind when you think of Great Britain? I would say it's Brexit, no? <laughs> anyway, um, now it's the turn of Mr. Jonathan McClory. Please, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Ambassador. And I, I know we're running short on time, so I'll whip through some of my slides and, and focus um, as much as possible on India. But I want to start my remarks with a quick confession. Uh, and that confession is that while I'm very excited and honored to be here and, and take part in this conversation, which I think is hugely important, when I received an invitation uh, to speak here in New Delhi, my first reaction was uh, anxiety, really. And the reason for that is the, the study that I run, the annual study, the Soft Power 30, which we work with um, uh, the University of Southern California Center on Public Diplomacy. It's been broadly received uh, pretty well uh, by uh, global media and, and uh, ministries of foreign affairs around the world. However, the one place where we get the most frequent and the mo most full-throated criticism of the study is here in India. And the reason for that is uh, the study that we run is actually uh, comprised of 60 different countries that we look at, uh, but we only publish the top 30. And quick spoiler alert, in, India is not in the top 30. And so there are plenty of um, Indian foreign policy experts and commentators who you know, get up in arms in this, how could you forget about India? How could you ignore India? So we don't ignore India. And I'm about to take you through and, and explain to you that we, we don't at all. They are included in the study. They just, India has not yet broken through the top 30. Um, and I hate to be a, a bad house guest in, in delivering what will be, I suppose, some mixed messages, but there's plenty of positives to, to think about um, as, as we look at uh, how India's soft power does. So that's what I want to do is, is use the, the Soft Power 30 framework to tell you a bit about um, where India's soft power resources stack up uh, with the rest of the world and, and where the areas that, that India could you know, benefit from working on, but where the strengths that we could uh, or India could potentially leverage more effectively. So I'm going to jump right into um, the main issue of measuring soft power. There we go. Um, so we, we've, we've, we've handled definitions. We know where we are with what soft power is. So the, the study that I run uh, is all about measuring soft power. And we've heard it can be nebulous. It can be hard to pin down. So what is this thing exactly? And, and that's what the soft power 30 tries to do is is look at what are the sources that make a country attractive to the rest of the world. And the reason that's important, this is a, a, a model here uh, that Joseph Nye developed, which is his model for converting soft power into an eventual outcome. And the first step of that model is understanding the resources that a country has. And without that clear account of what you've got to work with, 
uh, there's no point in talking a, a good game about soft power. So that's what the, the soft power 30 sets out to do, is, is to identify the resources of, of countries. So it's not so much about how well you use those resources, but what have you got to work with? And so this is the basic framework, and, and the point of the soft power 30 is that it combines objectively assessed data uh, with international polling data as well. And the objective data and the polling data really starts with Joseph Nye's three key pillars of, of sources of soft power, which are political values, culture, and foreign policy. Uh, and then we, we, you know, over a number of years have done a lot of uh, academic literature, literature review to look at what are the other factors that have an impact on, on perceptions of a country. And this is essentially um, our conclusion of what are those factors. And uh, so we set out to measure them. Uh, so this is the objective data. We, we start with that um, political values, which we capture in government. Uh, we look at foreign policy, which is engagement, like how, how well connected is a country, what's your diplomatic network, how many friends do you have, you know, your, your membership of different international clubs, um, and key leadership on big issues like environmentalism and, and overseas aid. Um, culture captures both high culture as well as pop culture. Um, enterprise is like how attractive is a country's economic and business model. Digital looks at a country's digital infrastructure as well as their, uh, their, their digital diplomacy network. Um, and then education is all around higher education, quality of universities, number of international students, um, as well as academic publishing. Uh, so those are the six um, main uh, uh, sources of objective data. But then soft power is inherently subjective, and so we have to embrace that in our design of measuring it. Um, so we, we poll 25 different countries, 11,000 people, nationally representative uh, samples in, in each of these countries to, to sort of get them to assess countries on seven different um, key aspects, you know, the most common touch points that they might um, experience a, a country uh, or through which they might experience a country. Some, some things like cuisine, culture, uh, how, how welcoming they think a country might be, as well as uh, the perceptions of a country's foreign policy. Um, I'm going to skip through the results. They don't really matter that much. I invite you to look at the study. You can find it at uh, softpower30.com. Um, and I just want to get straight to India. I, I did try and quickly address the UK, which came top this year, which seems really strange with Brexit. Of course, Kieran, I'm sorry. You're going to have a tough job ahead of you next year. Um, and the main point I want to make is, you know, the UK has a great balance of assets. Has the UK left the European Union yet? No. It hasn't. And so everything, that, all the assessment that, that, that was done for this year's study shows that the UK is still in the European Union and still in good position, even though it looks like, frankly, a bit of a basket case right now. Again, Kieran, I'm sorry. Um, but, but you still have some great resources to work with. And when it does leave the European Union, life's going to get more difficult for the UK. On to India. So India overall came for, uh, 41st out of 60. On the face of it, this looks like an underperformance, and admittedly, I think it is an underperformance for India when you consider all that has to offer. But we, we can break that down a little bit and, and see what happens. So India has big strengths. Its clear strengths are in digital, in government, you know, being the world's biggest democracy, and in culture, which I guess shouldn't surprise us that much. And we can break that down a bit further. So this is looking at all the objective metrics, right? They, each of, all the objective metrics are structured into sub-indices, and you can look at a country's individual performance on those. So like I said, digital, government, and culture, this is where they rank uh, out of the 60 countries. Um, so they haven't broken into the top 30 in those strengths, but they're, they're knocking on the door. And then there's a bit of a, a weighing effect from enterprise, engagement, and, and education. And I'll come to uh, uh, engagement in a bit. Now, if we look at the polling data, India does much better on culture, which shouldn't really surprise us, and, and that's where India does break into the top 30. Um, so there's a, there's a recognition of, you know, well, there's benefits of being the world's, you know, longest continuous civilization, obviously, and, and people do recognize um, Indian culture. And then uh, technology as well, um, India does fairly well, at, but cuisine, I feel like that's an area where India should be doing better, but it's not cutting through. But maybe given the discussion we had this morning, it's, it's on the up, so that's one to watch. Um, so let me just leave with a, a few final thoughts. I know I've whipped through this very quickly. Um, the first is that I know on the whole, over the, India's overall ranking looks like a bit of an underperformance, but there are real strengths uh, that India can use in terms of its soft power, particularly around culture and digital, as well as playing up its, um, its political values and being the world's largest democracy. But fundamental issues remain, which you know, we're, we're all aware of, issues around pollution and sanitation um, and how India is portrayed as well, my third point, in terms of global media. 
global media is rarely helpful when it comes to uh, presentation of India. Um, and a lot of that comes down to some of the big issues that they like to just hammer away on. So there is an image problem and there is, there is a need for India to, to tell its side of the story more effectively. Um, and related to that is that I think India needs, and I'm not saying it doesn't have this, but it clearly doesn't cut through. India needs a clear mission, a global role that is bigger than itself. Um, and it's from the presentation from the ambassador, it's, it's clearly there's substance there to it, but it, it's not getting across. And related to that, I think for a country of its size and importance, India needs a bigger diplomatic network. Um, it, it's, it, it is smaller than, I'm trying to remember, I think, I think oh, I'm gonna get this wrong. I wanna say Belgium has more embassies abroad than, than India, um, which just seems crazy. Um, and I think for a country of India's importance, it needs to be out there and, and be building more of its own platforms to, to leverage some of its assets. Um, and that's really my, my fifth and final point, is that an expanded and empowered diplomatic network would, would go a long way to India being able to, uh, to get its own point across. So that's, that's my overview. I, I hope that was just a helpful take and a step back to see where does India's soft power stand right now globally, and, and let's, we can focus on the positives, which there are plenty to take away. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Mr. McClory, you, you have given the audience a lot of food for thought, I'm sure. And I think on your presentation, there may be, or there ought to be uh, questions uh, from the audience. We don't have too much time, uh, but uh, with the permission of the organizers, maybe can we extend this session by 10 minutes? All right, okay. Thank you um, for Mr. McClory, clearly a question. Um, and I understand when you first got up there and you explained, kind of gave a, uh, um, your reason why India is, is the status that it is. I guess I, I'm looking at it and I noticed that 13 of the 15 top countries are European. And then the only other two are the United States and Australia. And so I, I guess I, I think as an educator, I would think if my criteria puts it's so Eurocentric. Maybe I should rethink my criteria rather than rethink India so much. I'm wondering if you've ever uh, thought about that. I, I well, definitely uh, have. Just, just excuse me. I'm oh, sorry. Be, because the organizers have told me that I, one can't extend the session, but they have been generous enough to allow two more questions. So let's take those two questions and then we'd ask the panelists to respond. Yes? Yes, please. Uh, hello. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your informative uh, lecture on this. I have uh, two doubts. First, I will put some words on soft power. One thing is not discussed very clearly over here, that in the world today, most of the revenue which is generated by some developed countries, not all, is either by weapons or by selling medicines or by selling oil. India is one of the largest producer of medicines and exporting it. So obviously I think it is doing a soft role. Now, can you tell me what is common between US, UK, Russia, and China? They all are producing a lot of weapons. I don't know where they're being consumed. I don't have that IQ. I'm a very common Indian standing besides. And similarly for oil. We have followed the philosophy of Atiti Devo Bhava. That means uh, guest is our God. But in present scenario, the soft power which we followed 200 years back by welcoming everyone to our country, and what resulted is lock or plunder. So instead of soft power, if we talk of soft power and a strong approach, it will be easy. Because the countries who are getting soft, they are just getting their time passed and not getting strong. At the same time, a lot of money is being invested on missiles, creating weapons, selling weapons, and then re generating revenue. But as far as medicines are concerned, because diseases may, are there, may, oil may can to please ask the question because since we are short of time. So my question is in one line, yes, is please. producing weapons is a method of creating soft power or hard power? Okay, right. I'm afraid that will be the last question. Yes. This is to Mr. Sibyl actually. No, no, not to me, I'm chairing the session. If, if you allow <laughs> me the last question. No, uh, please in ask recent, the panel. In recent times, mm. China has projected itself through the One Belt, One Road initiative very effectively. 
and you're a proponent uh, of both soft and hard power. What could be India's global approach to developing the rest of the world using some of its own resources? Look, what I'll do is I'll answer your question offline, as they say, because we should <laughs> leave the panelists uh, uh, to answer the questions that have been put. Please, Mr. McClory. Yeah, sorry. Um, the so first question. I have, I have uh, thought about uh, that question because that's usually the, the, the question we get asked. That that's tends to be the um, one of the main criticisms, especially when I'm outside of Europe, particularly in Asia. Um, I think I, I certainly hold my hand up and, and say the concept of soft power itself has a bit of an inbuilt Western bias. Um, and I would actually point to what the ambassador said that um, soft power is built on uh, was effective pl loud platforms and hard cash. And that is kind of that is true. There's, there's no escaping that, that, that to, to have soft power resources, one must be able to pay for them. Uh, and a lot of the, the European countries or the Western countries that are you know, in, in the top 15, uh, they, they have the money to pay for them. They, they have a developed economy. Um, and so if you, if you are a developed economy state, you, you, have, you have an advantage in soft power. Um, and that's unfortunately just the way that it is. It doesn't mean that you know, other countries, middle income countries, developing countries do not have soft power assets. Um, but when you, when you assess them all together, um, in, an, in a kind of aggregated format, which is what we, we try and do, um, that's just what gets spit out. Um, but I, I, I totally take the, the criticism, and, um, and it's definitely something that I've thought of and always trying to think, how can we tweak it? I think the most important thing to do is move away from the aggregated, which is why I didn't spend any time to say these are the top 30, and, and do the breakdown and see, well, where are the strengths that we have and, and what can we use? Um, and I think that's, that's more useful. Would you like to answer, Mr. Wang, the second question? since you have the biggest defense budget in the world. <laughs> well, maybe I just add to the question and then maybe say, uh, say a little bit about the other question. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very valid point. I think you may, I mean, we may ask uh, Joseph Knight tonight, oh, is he alive through uh, the, the video conferencing or just recorded? But because the, the whole concept is based on uh, his argument. And uh, uh, we've tested uh, you know, these dimensions and uh, his concept uh, in terms of the role of soft power in international relations. And so far, this is the one that's the most viable explanation of what we see in the international relations dynamics. Are there alternative um, frameworks? I'm sure uh, there may be somewhere, but it just we haven't seen anything that's articulated uh, as clearly. And I think uh, that could be the reason that you know, uh, we are using this, uh, you know, these are the dimensions and then, then uh, the European countries uh, tend to score very high on these dimensions, yeah. Uh, the other question about that, basically it is a question about, so the hard power versus soft power. And I said, you know, in the United States case is that soft power is tremendously important because there's a counterbalance to the military power that US has. May, may, I, I, before I close the session, may I just take a minute to just say a few words. One is that I think the world is schizophrenic because we have both constructive forces and we have disruptive forces. There is clearly a yearning for peace, but there is also the use of military power everywhere and expansion of military power. There's multilateralism, which we see in the social media, being very, very effective. Uh, but then you have this unilateralism at the political level. You have, of course, cultures coming together, but then we find that recently, as we see in Europe, uh, there are now cultural problems that are arising even in the most advanced democracies. We have arts which bring us together, but then we also have destruction of heritage sites and destruction of uh, uh, artistic and, uh, legacies. All of us agree that there should be equal equality since we value democracy, but we see rising inequalities both in the world and within countries. So I think uh, we have to live with this uh, uh, situation. Uh, insofar as India is concerned, I think as an old civilization, uh, we have immense, immense soft power resources. And we are well placed to capitalize on them because our rise is not seen as a threat. The rise of China is seen as a threat. And with regard to the question that was asked about China and OBOT, 
All I can say is that most of the rest of the world, whether it's the United States or Europe or Japan, they are now accepting our thinking and our view on the Belt and Road Initiative and its place and its role in expanding China's geopolitical ambitions, which they are not hiding anymore. And the rest of the world is getting concerned. Thank you. Now let's give a big hand to all the panelists. May I uh, request the chair for the session, Kamal Sibalji, to please present token of her appreciation to all the speakers, starting with Ambassador Sayyad Akbaruddinji, who was the keynote speaker for the session. I now request uh, Kamal Sibalji to please present a token of our appreciation to Mr. J. Wang from Center for Public Diplomacy, <laughs> USC. <laughs> Next, uh, to Mr. Kirian Drake, who's from the British High Commission here in India. And finally, to Mr. Jonathan McClory, the author of Soft Power 30 Report. May I request uh, Professor Sunana Singh, the Vice Chancellor of Nalanda University and member Board of Trustees India Foundation, to please present a memento to the chair for the session, Ambassador Kavan Sabalji. Thank you all. We start the next session in exactly five minutes and it's a fascinating session on museums as soft power. There are three 